I want some of you here that probably aren't baseball or softball fans, maybe didn't play a lot of baseball or softball growing up, just put on a coaching hat because that's who are going to see this video. We're videoing this and I'm going to put it up on my video blog because there are some coaches out there that this is going to speak directly to. As Dee said, the title of this speech is Cargo Cult Science May Be Causing You to Lose Out on the Truth. And we are going to be going over quite a few different quotations by some experts because I, I am I, I'm by no means a scientist and I don't claim to be one and represent one online. So I'm going to quote some of the scientists, the key ones that I've recently been reading into. So there are going to be some quotes. There's going to be a little bit of reading in the beginning, but once we get through that, it'll be a little bit more, I'm sure it'll maybe a little bit more entertaining than, reading, than watching me read quotes. All right, so let's here. So the first quote by Robert Persig said that the real purpose of the scientific method is to make sure nature has misled you into thinking you know something you don't know. The next one is by Albert Einstein. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. That's a great quote. As we lead into what we're covering today, how important maintaining an objective process. Now Dave mentioned Toastmasters tries to use an objective process for a subjective, what would you say? Standard. Your standard, for subjective standards. So subjective would be, it's up to our own kind of discretion. Uh, we try to make it as objective as possible. We're also going to talk about what the scientific method is for those of you who are kind of far removed from high school. I, I don't remember it either. I had to kind of read up on it myself. What the scientific method is. Also, this was something that was part of the speech requirement itself was to send you to a website, which our guests obviously haven't got, got to go to the website. I don't know if any of you got, had got to go there. but. You can check it out by just going to go, gohpl.com forward slash swing experiment. And that is where I put basically my blueprint for running swing experiments. And again, you've got your coaching hat on here, so coach is going to be seeing this, this is where they're going to go. And how far I've come since my 11-year-old swing experiment, which we will go over a little bit later. So we have to introduce a couple of cast of characters. Number one is Dr. Ben Goldacre. He is, to give you some credibility on this guy, instead of just reading his name and being like, who's this guy? He's a best-selling author, broadcaster, campaigner, and medical doctor and academic who specializes in unpicking the misuse of science and statistics by journalists, politicians, quacks, drug companies, and more. His book is, we'll go over it a little bit, is it's called Bad Science. The other one is Dr. Richard Feynman. I mentioned him in a meeting a couple meetings ago. He's an American theoretical physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project. He's a scientist on the Manhattan Project. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 65. The British Journal of Physics, uh, British Journal of Physics World said he was ranked as one of the, the top, the 10 greatest physicists of all time. And also his book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, was a New York Times bestseller. So to give you a little credibility. Now this is the Dr. Ben Goldacre book, Bad Science, Wax Hacks, and Big Pharma Flax. And first we're going to talk about a quote by him. Now this is, this is kind of summarized or a little bit taken a little bit of it. I'm going to actually read a little bit more. But he said, I spend a lot of time talking to people who disagree with me. I would go, go so far as to say that it's my favorite leisure activity. This guy's a little sarcastic, by the way. And repeatedly, I meet individuals who are eager to share their views on science despite the fact that they have never done an experiment. They have never tested an idea for themselves <coughs> using their own hands or seen the results of that test using their own eyes. And they have never thought carefully about what those results mean for the idea they are testing using their own brain. To these people, science is a monolith, a mystery, and an authority rather than a method. Now, Dr. Richard Feynman's best-selling book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, he talks about, which the title was, we talk about cargo cult science, and this is where we, we kind of get in the egregious part of the pseudoscience, if you want to call it pseudoscience. And he says that pseudoscience is, he talked about in the South Seas, there's a cargo cult of people. During the war, and I think this was World War II, they saw airplanes land with lots of good materials. And they want the same thing to happen now. 
So they've arranged to imitate things like runways to put fires along the sides of runways. And by the way, this is a this is Dr. Feynman in his book. This is cut out of his book. To make wood to make a wood hut for a man to sit in with two wood pieces on his head like headphones and bars of bamboo sticking out like antennas. He's the controller, and they wait for the airplanes to land. They're doing everything right. The form is perfect. It looks exactly the way it looked before, but it doesn't work. No airplanes land. So I call these things cargo cult science because they follow all the apparent precepts and forms of scientific investigation, but they're missing something essential because the planes don't land. Now this is the basis of what the speech is talking about. And Dr. Feynman in his book, he, this is paraphrasing what he said, but this is what he said about maintaining an objective nature. Give people all the facts they need to judge the value of your contribution, not just the information that leads to judgment into one outcome or another. Think about the pharmaceutical companies and some of the drugs that they put out. Some of the cons against in the testing that they do these drugs are shelved because they aren't pro-drug. They are pro for the drug. A lot of times shell. And a lot of those, those shell things is from ben, Dr. Ben Goldacre in his book. A lot of those shell results from the studies can actually help people, keep people from dying. So be careful of biases, is what Dr. Feynman says. So what is the scientific method? In science class, the first step in the scientific method is we ask, ask a question. And that's what we find with a lot of these physicists, scientists, is they ask questions. And Albert Einstein, Dr. Ben Goldacre, all these guys, and, and, and even women, great women in science, ask a question. So it could be a question, so with hitting, it could be like what we're going to go over is, what happens when we do one thing, say showing, if you have numbers on your back, showing your numbers at landing when the hitter lands, versus not showing the numbers at landing. What happens? That's a, that's a question that we might ask. There's a background research component where we go in and we research other studies, other research that is out there, and not just, according to Dr. Feynman, not just pro what you think, what your hypothesis, to support your hypothesis, but also the con, too, presenting both sides. Then we go into a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just a crazy word for I think this experiment. I think this is the answer to this, this question. This is what I think before even going into the into the research or data collection. The next is data collection. So whatever that looks like, and you can create experiments. You don't have to be a physicist. You don't have to be a scientist. You can do social experiments. You can do anything, and that's what something in Dr. Feynman's book that he did a lot of is he did a lot of just goofy experiments. He tried to see if ants how they figured out how to get to food, how they, how they figured out sugar, how they get to sugar. So he would do different things like putting them on little pieces of paper like this that were folded and he'd have them and transport them across the room and see how they would find their way back. And different things like that. It was just monkeying around. It wasn't an official experiment. But we can also do it with fitness, nutrition, and things like that. And I can answer questions after the speech for you guys if you have questions on that, how to kind of apply this to what you guys are looking at. Then we go into data, data analysis and conclusion. That's basically the scientific method, method in a nutshell. Obviously a little bit more complicated in some cases. So here's an evolution of my swing experiments. And we're talking about hitting here, baseball, softball, but swing experiments. So the first one that I did was, I was 11 years old, sixth grade, my buddy Mike Gillen and myself, we did an experiment in 1992 to see what hits the ball farther, a wood bat or a metal bat. Now you can guess your hypothesis, most of you would probably say a metal bat. And that's what, that's what our hypothesis was. We used one wood bat, we used two metal bats, two different ones, different sizes, pitched to each other. We looked at between 50 and 100 batted balls, so we measured about 50 to 100 batted balls. And we marked off the dis distances by stepping off each batted ball. So we're 11 years old. I don't think my feet were as big back then as they are now, but probably maybe about size 10. And we're figuring, oh, around a foot, 12 inches, so we added. And then my buddy's foot was, at the time, probably 13. He was a big dude. And he was marking off, and we were both marking off our own distances, different walls. So you can see how inaccurate that was going to be. 
got a Sierra project. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an awakening. And at the time, I didn't know why. Well, we did a good job with this. We enjoyed this problem. We enjoyed the process. That was the problem. We enjoyed it too much. We didn't even really look into how to do it scientifically. <laughs> so the next one. So this is where I get into showing numbers versus not showing numbers. So basically, this just means that if the picture is over here, and I'm hitting, and I go into my landing position, that I'm showing my numbers. I've got my numbers on my back, and so what we use with my hitter, showing my numbers versus not showing the numbers. So for people watching on the video, showing the numbers this way versus landing, not showing the numbers. So this shoulder is kind of pointing at the picture versus showing my back the picture. So that was one of the first experiments I did, October 2014. I was trying to see which technique increased bat speed at impact and by how much. We used, or I used this, this is called a zip, zip app, and this goes on the knob of the bat. This one wouldn't really do very well because it's kind of got a goofy knob, but it would go on the knob of the bat, just kind of stretches around, and it's like gyroscope type stuff inside that's going to measure a few different things. Well, one, I was looking at bat speed at impact, <clears throat> and we were trying to see how much, if there was a difference. I took 100 consecutive swings one way, so 100 consecutive swings showing my numbers, and 100 consecutive swings not showing my numbers, so 200 swings total. I broke the swing into two steps, so just kind of like what I showed you. I got to landing, I paused for a second or two to make sure that I'm doing it right, and then took my, took my swing. What I found was there was an average six mile per hour gain in average bat speed, an average bat speed at impact by showing the numbers out of the 200 swings. The next, oh, pro, the problem with this was I didn't counterbalance the swings, which we're going to go over in a little bit, during this next, next experiment. So flash forward to August of 2015, almost a year later, hmm. I did an experiment was don't buy expensive baths before testing them first. So with this experiment, we're using the same company and size metal bat. It was a 34-inch, 31-ounce bat, so they call it a minus three, BB4. We're testing different models. That was the isolated variable. So we're testing, same company was Mizuno. We're testing the same size, but one was a $200 bat, one was a $400 bat. So it was just like an upgrade in the, in the technology, what they were saying. I took 200 counterbalance swings. Now the difference. 100 swings both ways, 100 swings one way, 100 swings another way. But this is something that I learned along the way is that we counterbalance swings, and I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. What that means is I would take blocks of 25 swings. So imagine a block being A and a block being B. I would do 25 swings, and how we order it is important. So A, we do 25 swings with the, maybe the cheaper bat. We do 25 swings B with the, with the other bat. So it would be A, B, B, A, and then we go B, A, A, B. So how we order those 25, those chunks of 25 swings matters big time. And again, I'll tell you why. So we use Zet, which I showed you here in this experiment, and we use the ball, a ball exit speed, or we're, we're looking at ball exit speed with just a basic radar gun. So hitter would stand behind, or the person would stand behind, meaning quite a distance, maybe like we're out, I'd be hitting, and then they would measure the ball exit speeds as we were going. So that's, that's what we use to measure that. So with counterbalancing, the benefit of that is it takes out the warm-up bias and it also takes out the getting tired bias. Because what I found, it's crazy, what I found was that it takes me about 70 to 75 swings to actually get up to top, like my RPMs, get up like super high, get where I'm 90 plus ball exit speed or bat speed. So if I was doing 100 swings one way, I wasn't warmed up yet. So very biased when it comes to warming up and then getting tired. If you got it in those chunks, everything you're tired, everything's tired. Both both sides are tired. So I found that the four hundred dollar bat outperformed on the Zep. So the, the Zep just measures bat speed. So how fast this bat is flying, how fast my hands are going, what angle this bat is going. So it outperformed by about two to three miles per hour on average. But it underperformed on ball exit speed, which is very important nowadays. They're looking at ball exit speed more more than the bat speed side. So ball exit speed is how fast that ball is coming off the bat. So the faster the ball exit speed, the harder that ball is coming off the bat. Bat speed is a little, little different. So it outperformed, the cheaper bat outperformed on ball exit speed by 4.6 miles per hour on average. That's a big, that's a big one. Because if we just round up to five and get round numbers, for every one mile per hour ball exit speed equals four feet of distance. 
So four times five would be 20, that's an extra 20 feet that the hitters hit the ball. So the problem is that the one bat was inloaded and the other one was a little bit more balanced. Inloaded just means more weight on the end and a little bit skinnier here. The other one was more gradual as it went up here. So that is a problem. This is something that I, I kind of found out later. Could have contributed to it. So I didn't necessarily isolate the variable as well as I did. How far I've come since 11 years old? How to isolate a variable? Breaking the swing apart, for example. Taking bigger sample sizes. So taking 50 swings or measuring 50 to 100 swings when I was 11 years old, that's not a big sample size. 200 is not even a big sample size. But I'm not going to go out and take 1,000 swings. <laughs> we'll be able to walk the next week. <laughs> Collecting accurate apples to apples data. A lot of people ask me, is this accurate? Is that app? And I say, well, maybe not, but at least we're taking apples to apples comparisons. So we're taking numbers from the same thing both times. That's what we're looking for is apples to apples. When my, my buddy and I were measuring with our feet, that wasn't apples to apples. <laughs> both at different size feet. Counterbalancing the experiment, taking out warm up and getting tired biases. What we went over how important maintaining an objective process and avoiding the destruction of cargo cult sciences or what they can cause. What is the scientific method? Evolution of my swing experiments and how far I've come since my 11 year old swing experiment. So please go to, and go into the coaches again, gohpl.com forward slash swing experiment. Share your swing experiments on the blog in the comments. Thank you. The Hitting Performance Lab wants to know, did you know repeatable hitting power does not start in the hips? Have you heard the expressions, load and explode the hips, power comes from the hips? Well, we created a free video revealing the results of a scientific study that will show you how we added 48 feet of batted ball distance instantly. And it's not all about the hips. Click here now to get the video while it's still free.